All right. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me um, to give a presentation here. I'm very happy to uh, share the progress that we're making on helping researchers access genetics data for the research. Um, I'm from uh, Repositive. We're a small company in Cambridge, UK. We were spun out of the charity DNA Digest, uh, which is a charity that promotes efficient and ethical data sharing for research. Um, and I want to tell you something about uh, how open access is not the same as accessibility. Um, so, um, the whole point being there's lots of data, and in this point I'm talking about data publishing, um, but data being available is not the same as it being accessible, in the sense accessible for research use. Um, but I want to preamble my presentation with uh, an example that came up just last week, not in terms of data publishing, but in terms of uh, paper publishing. So I, I saw this announcement from Science Open that said that um, they had uh, they'd started a new partnership with the Cielo, which is a scientific electronic library online that had 600,000 open access articles that nobody ever heard of, uh, just from the fact that they were not, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that they were not indexed. Um, so the, these, uh, Cielo is the uh, leading open access publisher in Latin America, um, but because Latin American ecosystem of science is sort of separate from all the uh, European and American ecosystem, that the um, resources that are used for indexing papers are different, and these papers were not indexed by um, uh, our part of the world, in the Western world. Um, so, the point being, let's see here, what point is this? Yeah, so, um, so it's only recently been integrated into uh, the web of, web of science, but they only covered half of their journals. Um, and the, the conclusion here was that the fact that you have this big publisher publishing open access papers is not the same as these papers actually being accessible or accessed by the rest of the world. There's something more that's needed. It's not just a website somewhere that has something that's openly available for anyone who wants it, it's also about whether you can find that website somewhere with that information on it. And the same goes for papers, the same goes for data, and it's data that we're working with in, in, in the genomics research, so that's what I want to talk with you about. But I just thought that this was a very recent example of how this principle applies um, generally, that open access is not the same as visibility, accessibility, discoverability. So um, we studied this particular problem in genomics research. So we looked into, and, and this was based on, um, well, the whole reason for the, the charity to start in the first place was because uh, I myself experienced the, the, the lack of access to data for research, which caused uh, me to spend a lot of time looking for data and accessing data when I should spend my time analyzing data. Um, so within DNA Digest and later Repositive, we researched how big is this problem actually? How many researchers have a problem of finding and accessing data? And we found that there's actually a long, long road to, from the point when you want to access some data to you actually have access to the data, um, which goes from uh, searching for where the data is, so the data discovery part, which can be anything as random as word of mouth. Maybe you heard someone talking about a data set at a conference, or it could be like browsing the web, or maybe you browse through papers that you know, and maybe some papers mention data, and maybe if they mention data, maybe you can find where the data is, and then if you can find it, maybe you want to access it. All of that is the data discovery part, and then after that, once you've found some data, uh, unless it's open access, where you can usually go more or less directly to access it, um, down here, you'd need to go through an approval process because if it's genetics, genomics, it's usually clinical data which might have confidential information, so you actually have to apply for access. So you have to go through an application process saying what you want to use the data for, that you're going to keep it confidential and secure, and you're going to uh, adhere to the consent that was given for data usage, um, which is a process that can take a long time. But just looking at the, um, uh, the open access, then th that should be the most straightforward way. If you find some data, and if it's open access, well then you can just go straight there and access the data. Um, so we, we published this, um, uh, the result of this uh, survey, but one of, the, um, one of the findings that came out of it as well was um, 
that the data that you access and how frequently you access data depends a lot on whether that data is open or restricted. You can almost tell from the um, stepwise diagram that I showed there in the background that if there's lots of steps to get access to data, it means that it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. So um, we asked uh, the researchers how often they would access data, if whether it, how often they would access data that was publicly available, how often they would access data where they needed to apply for data access. And if they needed to apply for data access, it went towards rarely or never uh, access this data, whereas if it was publicly available, they would be much more likely to, to access it. So this um, is sort of uh, expected. You would expect, well, if it's easier to access, you probably access it more. But this is just a confirmation of that um, notion. But the more frequent access to open access data uh, only happens if you could actually find the data. Oh, where is it? There you go. Um, because it took them so long to find data, and if uh, the process, so that just that first bit of the diagram in the back, the, the time just to find the right data could take anything from weeks to months. And you might find the data that you need, you might not find the data you need, you might find some data, but it's bad quality. And just the effort of doing that um, also caused researchers to often not access data at all. Um, and thinking of biology and genomics as data-intensive sciences, if you think of data-intensive sciences where there would be situations where researchers choose to not access more data that they can use for evidence, not access more data they can use for validation uh, or for replicating their results, but just choose to go with what they have. You can see how that could actually lead to uh, the data that they eventually published based on what they have is then biased or it's not corrected or they're not uh, validated against existing published data and that then skewing the uh, results that you see in the published literature. So it's, it's a problem if you, there's data out there, it's even openly available, but if it's not used, uh, it's not helping or benefiting the research community. So, um, there's a, a gap, uh, and I think of it as the, uh, the visibility gap, uh, because there's the data that you can find directly, because you know where it is, or it's easy to find, it's easy to access, and then there's all the other data. And from the same study, we've asked researchers to just list the data sources that they knew about. So where do you find data? Tell, tell, tell us where. And they would start listing, oh, I could find data in EGA, I could find data in dbGaP, I can find data in GEO, Array Express. And then it would start going slower and slower. And some people would be able to mention maybe five, maybe six or seven, maximum 10 data sources they would be able to mention of where they would know there would be data available. Um, but the fact being, uh, there's a lot of more data out there. So we did a, a, a summary statistic over this, and, and um, the numbers keep increasing. But last time we did a, a census of how many data sources are available for genetic researchers that they can go and access data from today. Um, last time we did um, a big statistic over it was it was 163. Now the number is more than 200 because we discover more as well. We still don't know all the data sources. Um, but that means that um, those researchers that stop and don't use the data because they can't find it, um, it's simply because they're not seeing what's available. There's a, a big visibility gap, there's a discoverability gap. Um, you can read some more about data sources in our PLOS biology paper. I'll put that link in the slide so that if you want to download the slides later, you can go have a look. Um, and of these uh, data sources, the majority of them are open access. So of these 163 uh, data sources for genetics research, of data that can be searched today and used today, a lot of it is open access. Some of it is restricted access, meaning that you need to apply for it first, but yes, you can access it. Um, but that just means that there's like 10 to 20 times more data out there that can be accessed directly if you just know where it is. 
So what's happening to all this data just sitting around not being used? So the researchers are trying hard, they're trying to find data, but they end up giving up or just go with what they have because they can't find it, but there's lots of data out there. Um, this, is a, this is a big problem. Um, it's, a, it's a problem for the researchers, of course, that they don't get as quality results as they would if they would have gotten access to the data that could improve uh, their research, but it's also, oops, it's also a problem of um, um, the, the, um, the data not being reused and the data uh, in these, especially in the public repositories that have been funded, publicly funded to be available for the research community, but it's not being used by the research community, then it's just sitting there being a waste of money. Um, and just to give some examples of some of the, um, uh, in case you don't know about, I mean, many people in the room are not specifically in genomics, but there's lots of genomics data out there, and there's lots of projects even that have open access data in genomics. And I just put some of the most prominent ones here because you might be able to recognize some of them. So maybe you've heard of the Personal Genomes Project with hundreds of people in the US with the whole genome and, and clinical data available open access online. You might have heard of OpenSNP, which is crowdsourcing uh, genomics data from individuals can contribute their genomics data to a public resource. Um, you might know uh, GigaScience both as a publisher, but they also have uh, GigaDB where they keep all the data that is published alongside their journal and it's all open access and includes lots of genomics data, including human genomics data. Um, there's also lots of individuals making difference in this. So this is uh, Manuel Corpus and his family. He crow first crowdfunded uh, the sequencing of his genome and then crowdsourced the analysis of his genome and put all the data and all the analysis available open access online for anyone to use. But if you go around ask researchers around, and you hear me mentioned before, they'll start mentioning these, a couple of uh, public uh, data sources, but they don't know of all these other projects that have lots of valuable data that's available to use right now. Just go ahead once you know where it is. So um, how do we close this gap? Uh, making data more visible and discoverable. Uh, there's, of course, um, you need the data to end up in the public domain somehow, right? So if it's uh, in a repository, it needs to be uh, published there, it needs to be listed there. If it's in structured format, that's even better. Um, but you also want to increase the data reuse. And as I said, it's, it's also a question of making better use of the funding that goes to generate all this data. And, having the impact for the research and drug discovery. In, in this case, when we're talking about genetics and biomedical research, it actually has impact for patients in the end. Um, so you want to make this visibility without adding to the confusion. So if I just put all the, um, a number of data sources, just put them on a slide here, it will just immediately create a lot of confusion, not necessarily help you find the right data that you need. So what we've uh, made with Repositive is that we've made a, an index, it's a portal where we are indexing all the metadata from the data sources that we're discovering. Um, it's right now in beta testing uh, and we have researchers from all over the world logging in, using it to, to find data. Um, it's a simple solution for the discoverability problem because it's just making a search portal where you can easily find genetics data specifically. We've indexed the first 42,000 uh, data sets, but we have these more than 200 data sources on a list of um, data sources to index, so we can um, use all of those to help the researchers find the right data. Um, it in, it's it's two-way because it's not only listing the, the data sets that come out of um, the public repositories, but we also make it possible for users to contribute to those descriptions, so they can also list their own data. For example, in the case of Manuel Corpus, he has a data set where he actually put the raw data in Figshare, but nobody knows it's there. So he put the raw data in Figshare and then make um, a listing on Repositive so that when people come to look for data, they also find his data and they get the pointer to where it is. This data is in Figshare, go ahead, download it, it's free. Um, and this, um, brings us to the, the, the last bit about um, visibility and why would the individual researchers want visibility? Because you've probably heard about problems about data sharing and researchers not wanting to uh, give their data away because they first want to get all the results themselves and so on. 
Um, but what researchers do want to get is credit. Um, and it has been uh, investigated before, and, and um, a very good reference is um, uh, Heather Pivovar, who showed that if you publish open access data with your paper, you get more citations for your paper, which is a great result, and I'd love to quote it, because that's a way of telling researchers, please make your data available, not just publish your paper, but make the data available, because then you get more citations, your results become more use useful, they be, your data will be reused, and then you'll get citations, both for the data, but also for your, uh, for your paper. Um, but now we're interested in the, because I, as I just pointed out, there's a difference between just making the data open and then making it easy to find. So what we would like to find out is whether making the data more discoverable can actually increase the reuse. Um, so we are working with uh, Giga Science, uh, doing an experiment where we are listing uh, part of their data, part of their open access data on the repository platform, giving them more visibility for the target audience that are looking for that particular type of data. Um, and then we want to compare how does the access patterns and how many people download this data compared to data that did not get this extra publicity, if you want, of being listed in a, in a platform specifically for their target audience. Um, and I don't have any results on this yet, but I hope that uh, next time I see all of you, I'll be able to tell you, look, this is the difference that it makes it. If you take open access data, but you increase the discoverability of it just by indexing it in the right places where people go to look for it, then you actually increase the reuse, you increase the impact, you get more citations for that data, etc. Um, so that's just a, I don't know, teaser, a primer for what I'd love to present to you next time uh, I see you, but uh, that's it. Um, I've kept it short. Um, there's much more data on there, and there's more data in our paper as well, and um, if you'd like to know more about this or about any of data repositories, data sources in genomics, please just come and ask, because I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, questions? Thank you so much. That was uh, such an interesting presentation. And, and my question, may you may have uh, just alluded to this. I think you said you're a small startup firm, um, a spin-off in Cambridge. Is that right? Yeah, that's so I, I wonder if you could address what's the what's the uh, um, the business model that you would use, and also I wonder if you could comment on the sustainability yeah. issue. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So. Um, I initially founded the, the charity, DNA Digest, uh, for the purpose of making data more easily accessible for research. Uh, got lots of support from the community, but no funding. Um, and no um, grant funding specifically because as a newly started organization with no track record, if you apply for a grant to do something that you haven't done already, you don't get the grant. And I'm, I don't need to explain that to people in this audience. I think you all know how grants work. But, but in, the, in the case where you're like a new, newly started organization, and you want to do something that's new, uh, you don't get that money as grant money. Um, so after applying for every possible grant for about a year and a half, uh, we chose to spin out Repositive as a commercial company. <coughs> so by um, putting all the software development and also about making a sustainable business model around the platform, put that in a commercial company, that meant that we could get investment, that could get us started, that we could get funding, get us off the ground. And then to answer your question about the business model, um, what we're doing is that we are um, we're basically providing a service. Uh, so it's not only academic researchers who have the problem of finding and accessing data, it's also biotech companies and pharma companies. And for them, it's uh, a waste of time and effort if they spend their time searching for data. So basically, we can help them find the data more easily for what they need for specific purposes, and we can charge them for that. But as part of doing that, we are developing all that expertise in finding and accessing data. And listing all the data sources is our way of knowing where the data is. So this is a, a, it's both a, a side product of what we do, but it's also a way of showing off what we can do. To the, to the research community. So the idea is to have the platform where you can search for data for free, and then we can add uh, extra services on top. So for example, if you want uh, um, a team collaboration tool to integrate with it, or if you want to integrate it with your 
pharma company data management system or whatever, we can charge companies for doing that, but we can still keep the search platform as an open platform. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. uh, when you talk about open research data, uh, usually you get pointed in the direction of economics. That's a good example <laughs> yeah. of how things work uh, well with research data. So it, it was interesting to hear your problems with visibility. Yeah. And, and, and uh, so my question really is, why, why can't you find research data on Google? All researchers are using Google. <laughs> okay, so two, two points on that. So one is about the uh, quite uh, often quoted fact that oh, in genomics they got it, the whole sharing problem sorted out. <laughs> That's um, a fact from the past, because it's a fact from back when the first human genome was sequenced, when there was a, a race between uh, Celera, uh, a commercial company, and uh, the academic community trying to be the first to sequence the human genome. The academic community had no other choice than collaborate in order to get there first. <laughs> and they did collaborate and they did share the data and they got there first. So that's why the first human genome went immediately into the public domain and became a common resource for all. Um, but that is now repeatedly stated uh, as look how genomics got it sorted. But the fact being that today, if you look at research today, the way that it works and the data that's being produced today, it's not being shared, it's not visible, it's not if you look at how much data is being produced and how much of that data is being actually deposited in some public repositories, it's a tiny, tiny fraction. It's, uh, I, it's, it's so, so small that I don't have a, a number per year, I only have a number over all time. Um, it's a, <laughs> a tiny, tiny fraction. Yeah. Um, and the second question was about um, why can't you just use Google? Well, the thing is, if you use... Um, so, thing is, Google doesn't know what you're searching for, which is the reason why you have separate search engines for flights or hotels, or because if you just search, uh, I don't know, Tuscany and swimming pool, you get all sorts of blog posts and, uh, I don't know, websites, whereas what you're after is actually a hotel that has a, um, I don't know, swimming pool in Tuscany. You know, it, it's about uh, having the context right. Um, so the Although all that data that is on the web is indexed by Google, doesn't mean that it's uh, visible. It's, yeah, it's just the way yeah. that the mechanism works. But I mean, uh, when, when uh, researchers put their research data into these archives, they, they uh, use metadata also. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, when you're dealing with uh, articles, you make sure that your articles will be visible in, in Google, Google Scholar at least. Yes. And uh, it's yeah. the same with research data. And it, it is exactly that, because, because they then have a specific search engine, Google Scholar, to search articles, then you got your article discoverability problem sorted within, you know, within that search engine. But if you just use the general search engine, you don't find what you're looking for. And the same way you need a, a specialized portal if you're searching for data, because if you just search in the papers for data, you don't find it, you, know, you need um, a search engine where the relevant info is the, the info that's indexed in order to help you do your search. Thank you very much. Thank you.